Hi, welcome back to class, and I want to speak for a few minutes on a key topic as we've been working through Genesis 1 to 11, and, and that's the issue of myth and whether or not there's any myth in the scriptures. Uh, this is an important question because when we typically think of the word myth, we think that of stories that aren't true. It was a myth or it was mythical. There are shows on television today called Mythbusters where people take an idea and demonstrate its falsehood. So one of the key things when, when we talk about the relationship between the Bible and the myth is going to be one of definitions. Because when we looked at, G at Genesis 1 to 11, we noticed some similarities, and, we, and, and these are true, between Israel's creation stories and the creation stories in the ancient Near East, and also the presence of the flood stories. And so a lot of times when we're teaching, people want to know if these are like the Canaanite myths, are the Israelite stories then true? Well, again, we get back to the, the problem of definition. Now, when we're trying to talk about what is historical and what isn't, that's a different type of a question, uh, because history essentially deals with what happened or what really happened, but the problem of history is that once an event passes, all that's left then is testimony about what happened. And this gets us into the whole issue of historiography. Let me write a couple of these words down too. Because when we talk about history today in historical writing or historical reporting, what we're really talking about is the word historiography, which has to do with all the different method methodologies about reconstructing the past to describe what happened based on testimony. And one of the key issues with reconstructing history, then, is your sources, and essentially the question, which sources do you privilege, which sources do you trust? Again, a lot of times the the Bible is not trusted for a, a, a range of, of issues, especially the Old Testament, and determining, in fact, that it's uh, a lot of the biblical books were written after the fact, after the event that it purports to teach. The Bible is often discounted because it attempts to actually persuade the reader versus simply inform the reader. So it has some ideological imports. And then the last time, a lot of times critics will discount about the Bible's testimony simply because the Old Testament is such excellent literature with the idea that well-structured, well-written literature probably isn't historical literature. So those are some of the issues. And uh, you can look at my essay, uh, Evangelicals and Historiography of Ancient Israel, which is available online for more about that and on the critique of those things. But let's get back to the issue of, um, of myth and the Bible again. And if you define myth too broadly, then that would mean that, yeah, the Bible does have myths in it. So, for example, some people, when they talk about myth, use a definition like this. Uh, narratives or stories about the deepest truths. Narratives or stories about the deepest truths. Now, notice, when you have such a broad definition like that, that can make virtually anything a myth. And so, in other words, it's not very helpful. So when we compare what Israel says about creation and what Israel says about the flood with its, within its uh, ancient Near Eastern context, it's, it's obvious that Israel has a radically different view of reality. And so one of the key questions when we talk about myth is these are all ultimately about worldviews. And what I want to suggest to you and give you is an easy way to understand the critical difference between the scriptures and Canaanite myth so that we can definitively say the Bible is not mythic uh, if we mean like the Canaanite stories. Now, I want to give you a couple of, of, of book suggestions to read if you want more on this because I'm going to be done with this lecture in just a couple of minutes. This is just more of a, a broad overview. John Oswalt, professor of uh, biblical studies, one of my teachers, still teaches at Asbury Seminary. He has a couple of books. One of them is The Bible Among the Myths, Unique Revelation or Just Ancient Israel. Uh, he has another book called Called to be Holy, and these two give Oswald's assessment of the ancient Near Eastern uh, myths and how the Bible's radically different. And in fact, uh, much of what I share is going to be heavily influenced by Dr. Oswald. 
Another book that I recommend from a slightly different perspective is by Peter Enns. It's called Inspiration and Incarnation. And Enns tries to understand scripture in light of its similarities with ancient Near Eastern literature. And so those are two resources that I recommend. Again, the Bible among the myths and inspiration and incarnation. So let me answer the question uh, quickly. Now, what's the difference? The issue comes down to what we would want to call the principle of continuity. When you read Israel's scriptures, Genesis 1 to 11 gives a radically different view of God than is present in the Canaanite myths. And it's not merely a matter of monotheism versus polytheism, though it's related to that. So when you read Canaanite mythology or ancient Near Eastern mythology, again, you can look at, uh, at stories such as the Atrahasis account, Epic of Gilgamesh, You can read the Baal story, the Baal cycles that have been discovered from uh, uh, um, Syria, modern-day Syria. These give you a sense of what it looks like in the ancient Near East. And, and basically, their view of reality is that you can draw all reality and put a circle around it. And that this is essentially the universe. And that within the universe exist the gods exist humans, animals, and objects. And in the ancient Near Eastern worldview, all of these things are essentially one. All these things are encompassed in the universe, and the, the difference as you go up the categories to be with the gods is the gods have more divine essence, if you will, than say a rock does, or a bunny rabbit, or a dog, or a people. And so everything is divine. And it's, in fact, when you get a, a sense of the mythic worldview, there's something bigger than even the gods. It's, it's essentially, if you think of Mother Earth, the universe, th this is the big category. And underneath that, all that exists, all creation is divine, and everything permeates with divinity. Again, the categorical difference is how much of the divinity you have. If, if you're familiar with the Star Wars stories and the Star Wars mythology, uh, think about the Force. The Force is this energy field, if you will, that encompasses all living creatures. And there are certain beings within the universe that function sort of as gods in this system. And that would be the Jedi and the Dark Side, the Sith. And both of these persons are able to actually have this, the metachlorians inside of them, they have more of the God stuff that allows them to have more powers than, say, a typical person or alien from another planet or animals or objects. So we can see this at play in, say, the Star Wars myths. But this is the way people thought, okay? And so in other words, the universe, everything is divine. Divinity permeates everything. Certain beings called the gods have more of that stuff than others. And so essentially, there's no real difference between gods and people other than the amount of god stuff. And so in, in many ways, the, the ancient Near Eastern gods are essentially reflections of what it means to be human. Okay, here's why the Bible is, admit, is not mythic, is not myth. Because the Bible rejects this system. Because the Bible argues for what? That there's a creator god, Yahweh, that stands outside of this system. This is critical in that this God created everything that exists, and so creation is not God. This is the principle of discontinuity. We might talk about this, the idea of a transcendent God. When we talk about transcendence, there's really only a couple of religions in the entire history of humanity that talk about transcendence. That's going to be Christianity Islam, and Judaism, and notice that all three of those come from a common root, this Jewish idea that there's a transcendent God stands outside of time and space, outside of creation, that spoke creation into existence, and so that none of creation is actually divine. Rather, it's the creative work of the only truly divine being that exists, the Lord, the God. And so in this way, when you read the creation stories and the flood stories, though they have some commonalities in terms of narrative with 
the ancient Near East, their Eastern, Eastern context, they're radically different in their conception of God. And so Israel's stories exist to give us a radically different worldview and conception about who God is. So when you read these stories, it's not so much to try to get history out of these, but these stories exist in a sense to tell the true story about God and the true nature of reality, that there's a God out there who compared to the gods is not even, it has to be a totally different category. So early in the scriptures, Israel's primary purpose isn't to not deny the existence of gods, but it's more subtle. What the scriptures want to do is deny that there's any being worthy of the title of God other than the Lord. And the reason that's true is because it's only the Lord who's the transcendent creator who spoke everything else into existence. And the very things that people think are gods are actually just part of creation. That's a little bit on the Bible and myths. I look forward to some more conversation with you. Again, I'm Brian Russell, and thank you for listening.